Today we're wrapping up the series that we started in January based on the book, The War for Kindness, Building Empathy in a Fractured World by Jamil Zaki. When we got started on the first Sunday last month, I noted how the subject of kindness and empathy had become a hot topic in our culture. Recently, uh, we had the movie about Mr. Rogers, the one called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, which got some great reviews. And the best known quote from the real world, Mr. Rogers, was uh, this one right here where he says, there are three ways to ultimate success. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. The third is, guess what? To be kind. Mm -hmm. But we've already heard from Mr. Rogers, so um, what perhaps have some other folks had to say on the subject? I think we all know that the Dalai Lama is an outspoken advocate of kindness and compassion. That's a real Buddhist thing. He is known for having said, this is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. The philosophy is kindness. And sometimes he gets paraphrased as saying simply, my religion is kindness. Now the other thing the Dalai Lama said was, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. <laughs> of course, there's always Mark Twain, right? You can't get away without uh, Mark Twain, who seemed to have a lot of things to say about a lot of things. But he said, kindness is the language the deaf can hear and the blind can see. He was a poet, too. And we need something a little more contemporary. So for that, we have Kurt Vonnegut here. Jacob, flip back to Mark Twain for a minute. Now back to Kurt Vonnegut. You, you, you notice this? I, I never noticed that before until I put these two slides together. I'm thinking they're, they're the, a brother from another mother. I don't know how they say that. It's, uh, but uh, both, very, both very witty. Kurt Vonnegut died in 2007, and they did a tribute to him in a literary magazine where they said, a thoroughly political and philosophical writer, Kurt Vonnegut argued zealously for the place of human kindness amid the crushing tumult of modern life. His literary expressions of this message were sometimes simple, sometimes repetitive, not because his intellect was limited, but because his conviction on this point was massive. All right, and the money quote from Mr. Vonnegut from his book, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. He's giving advice. Uh, Diana was singing earlier, the children are our future, right? This is advice to the new children on planet Earth. He says, hello, babies. Welcome to Earth. It's hot in the summer, cold in the winter. It's round, wet, and crowded. On the outside, babies, you've got a hundred years here. There's only one rule that I know of, babies. God damn it, you've got to be kind. <laughs> there you have it. And speaking of the babies, speaking of the children, Having said all of that, I was so happy to see something that was on a sign that's outside of an elementary school. It's just around the corner from where we live. Uh, we were out there on Monday. We take the dogs out on a walk every day. It takes us right past this sign that had this message on it. Cobblestone Elementary. Cobblestone Cougars choose kindness. Won't you too? Isn't that great? These babies get it, right? They get it. They're our future indeed. You know, we've seen over the, the course of this book that the foundation for kindness is this thing called empathy. And in the epilogue of the book, the author sums it all up like this. He says, in this book, we've toured empathy's battlefields. We've seen the forces that push us toward hatred and indifference and seen people push back against them. Many of them have won, defeating their own estrangement toxic cultures, even actual war to reclaim their humanity and discover each other's. But the war we're fighting is much bigger. Our empathy is the legacy we leave generations to come who must leave, live in the world we leave behind. So he goes on to ask this all-important question. How can we be the ancestors they deserve. How can we be the ancestors they deserve? And the first thing, the first thing that has to happen is we have to begin 
to deal with just how short-sighted we've become as a culture. Meet Ari Wallach. This is Ari Wallach. He's a very well-known business consultant. Uh, he's called a futurist as well. He's the founder of an organization called Long Path. This is the web page here, the Long Path web page with the banner on it. Be great ancestors. Long Path is the movement to become great ancestors. Long Path is an applied mindset that cultivates future conscious thinking and behavior. Long Path helps individuals, organizations, and society as a whole counter our instinct for short-termism, build more hopeful visions of the future, and turn those visions into action. The reason he took this direction is because he was noticing that his business clients were focusing on shorter and shorter time frames. Where they had once wanted him to, to work with them on formulating a plan spanning 20 years, they were now focusing on just the next six months. He refers to this as single marshmallow thinking. <laughs> That's based on a famous experiment. The marshmallow experiment was made famous by a psychologist named Walter Mischel. He would give children the option of having one marshmallow right now, which they could eat, or waiting a certain time frame, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then they would get two marshmallows. Across the board, the children had a really hard time waiting to get two and would settle for one. Not just children have this difficulty, but human beings in general have a hard time with long-term big picture thinking. And it gets more difficult as we grow older. I'm only 62, but I find myself at times thinking that it just ain't worth it. It isn't worth getting all worked up over politics or the state of the planet because I won't be around long enough to experience the worst of what might happen if certain social agendas become the law or if we continue to do nothing to acknowledge the reality of climate change. And then I think, well, we have grandchildren, we have great-grandchildren, what kind of world are we leaving for them, and what will they think of us when they look back? Will they look at us the same way that we look back at our recent ancestors, the ones who insisted that women shouldn't vote or work outside the home, the ones who insisted that slavery was perfectly okay, or that polluted lakes and rivers were just the price we had to pay for economic growth. Tempting as it is, I don't want to give in to short-term thinking. Of course, there are some who say the real question here is, what kind of world will the young people leave for Keith Richards, Willie Nelson, and Betty White? <laughs> but regardless, regardless of who might still be around, it all gets back to the idea that we want to be great ancestors. And they're finding that empathy plays a major role in developing that kind of long-term thinking. One of, one of the goals expressed in this book is that more and more people start choosing to expand their circle of empathy, caring, and compassion. And the way it works is that it's initially focused on just me and my own survival, then me and my very nearest blood kin, and then on the larger tribe and the larger community beyond that, and eventually we have to expand that circle out to encompass all of humankind on planet Earth. Well, that's extending the circle in space. Now the challenge is we have to start extending that circle in time to the future, to be those ancestors that, uh, uh, that, we, that we will leave a, a healthy legacy to our, to our survivors. So, caring and compassion needs to include all of humankind and the future as well. So where do we start? How can we 
start learning how to do the most good with what we have right here and now in this particular space and time. Well, in addition to Long Path, there are other organizations that are dealing with this issue directly. Um, here's another example, one called Effective Altruism. This is a new movement that uh, has the core mission of providing an answer to the question of how can we use our resources to help others the most. Rather than just doing what feels right, and that's often what we do, we do the things that make us feel good, make us feel significant, rather than doing just what feels right, effective altruism uses evidence and careful analysis to find the very best causes to work on. They use science, especially math, to determine how to um, get the biggest bang for your buck. I guess that's the best way of saying it. The biggest bang for your buck, the most value for the time that you might put in, time and money. How do you get the greatest return for those things? So when deciding on a cause to support, they've done the analysis here. One of the examples that they give is the fight against HIV. I found the results to be counterintuitive. Um, in terms of saving lives, in terms of lives saved, the most cost-effective approach in dealing with HIV is education. Educating the most high-risk groups. It's far more effective in terms of lives saved compared to developing different kinds of medical treatment, distribution of condoms, and all those kind of things. Again, it may sound counterintuitive, but often our intuition is based too much on raw emotions rather than evidence. According to the uh, philosopher Peter Singer, who's one of the key figures in the effective altruism movement, we don't engage in effective altruism by giving to the cause which most effectively pulls the heartstrings. You know, there are plenty of those out there. Um, we do it by giving to the cause that can accomplish the most good. So as we go forward into the future with our intention of building empathy, um, I recommend a visit to Long Path, to the effective altruism web pages for some inspiration. Um, on Effective Altruism, they have this whole set of stories, uh, a whole bunch of stories about, about how much good just one person can do. And these are very often people we've never heard of before. Um, these are people who are properly regarded as heroes, but the point of telling their stories is to get across the idea that it's possible for anyone to have a tremendous positive impact on the world if they choose wisely. One of the things they recommend is that we stay focused on the good, which is something we really emphasize uh, in Unity in general. It's been a, a recurring theme in our message here at Unity of Auburn. Focus on the good. Look for the good. Doesn't mean we ignore the bad stuff that's happening, but the problem is that we seem to be trapped in a media environment that wants us to only focus on the bad stuff and completely ignore the ample evidence that we've made great progress in many areas. I even hear people saying things like, well, things haven't gotten better, and that progress is a myth. And it just, it just is not so. You might recall a couple of years ago, uh, we were working with uh, a couple of books. One of them was started by uh, Hans Rosling, the delightful Hans Rosling, who wrote this wonderful book called Factfulness. Ten reasons why we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. And he lays it out in statistics and information that uh, is pretty much irrefutable. Shows that we've made progress. Things are getting better in many, many different areas. One example, one powerful example, is uh, child mortality. Child mortality worldwide has gone down, and I mean way down, not just in high-income places where you know, we have good medical care and things like that, but even in low-income countries as well. Check out this graph here. Um, this is just from 1990 to 2017. Up at the top, that top line represents low-income countries, the ones that have had it really bad. 1990, the child mortality rate in low-income countries was over 16%. That's a huge figure. 
2017, it is down to very close to around 7%. It's a huge drop. That's a huge drop. So for anyone who says that progress is impossible, show them this. In fact, if, if you're tired of listening to long-winded, blowhard pessimists out there, send them over to one of these websites, and we've given you a list of them in the handout. Send them over there, or, or, or check them out yourselves if you're ever having a hard time, you know, seeing the good or, or thinking like I do sometimes, you know, like why bother, right? Check out these websites. They'll help to, to turn that around. Now, there are two last things that we can do to help develop the kind of long-term thinking that helps us to expand our empathy. And both of these are especially well suited to what we do and teach here in Unity. The first is gratitude. It's a big deal in unity, gratitude. According to uh, work done by psychologist David Desteno, practicing gratitude helps to promote the kind of wise choices that lead to long-term thinking and, of course, effective altruism. The other thing gratitude does is that it promotes this all-important action step that's, that's part of empathy. People who, who self-identify um, as grateful have a higher tendency to engage in altruistic action. So, there's always some form of gratitude principle that we teach here, and a very simple one, a very, a very pervasive one, you'll encounter this from our chaplains. Uh, we call it the five-step prayer process. Gratitude is step number five. You end with gratitude. It's the capstone of the process because after that, you're going out into the world and ideally, the prayer should lead to action. So gratitude leads to action. The second thing that can cultivate empathy and long-term thinking is the experience of awe. The sense of something so vast that it disrupts, it, it interrupts, it short circuits our daily preoccupations. In the book, he says that psychologists induce awe in people by showing them enormous things. A towering grove of redwoods, a skyline of Himalayan peaks, the Milky Way, the sweeping vistas of planet Earth. Afterward, people report feeling smaller, but also more connected to the rest of humanity, and they act more generously toward others. For me, Carl Sagan was a master at presenting the story of the cosmos in a way that consistently inspired awe. I remember when that show first came out back in the 80s, I was watching it on an old black and white TV. It didn't matter. It still, it still did it for me, that sense of awe as he explored the origins of, of life and the origins of the cosmos. And uh, in fact, in March, we're going to be talking about some of the ideas and themes that come from a brand new season of Cosmos, which uh, features Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's going to be on the National Geographic channel premiering on Monday, March 9th. So that's coming up, a brand new season of, of Cosmos, uh, also featuring uh, Ann Drurian, who was uh, Charles Sagan's uh, uh, widow and uh, directed by the uh, producer Seth MacFarlane. And uh, he's a pretty well-known guy, too. Other ways to intentionally bring about a sense of awe, these are some easy things for us to do. Take a nature hike. Or you can have an experience during, during meditation or an experience while you're taking in the arts. For me, music is a big one. And, and the great thing about music is that it's as close to me as my smartphone and a set of earphones. Although, there's nothing quite like going to a live concert for inducing that experience of awe through music. In my humble opinion, everyone should get to hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in person with a full chorus at least once in their life. And I will tell you this, if that last movement doesn't induce some awe in you, you might want to check your pulse to make sure you're still among the living. Something else. So that's all for now on empathy and kindness. We're going to move on. Next month we'll take a look at some topics uh, from the Cosmos series, topics on the leading edge of science and spirituality, and we might even see some more stuff that induces awe. See you then.